Good evening. I'm Peter Penoyer, president of the Whiting Foundation. Welcome all of you to our 36th Whiting Awards, where we celebrate great talent and great promise. This is our second and we hope our last remote ceremony. But as our speaker, Sarah Rule, commented last year, the libraries may be closed, but the books are open. This challenging year has taught us new ways of gathering and celebrating. And we are delighted to have so many people across the country who are able to join us today to meet the winners. First, on behalf of the trustees, I want to thank Daniel Reed, our executive director, for his energy and imagination, and Courtney Hodell, director of our writers programs, for her excellent work. Before we start, I will tell you a bit about the awards. No one applies for a wedding. Each year, about 100 people around the country, authors, editors, teachers, artistic directors, critics, each nominate one author. Then six quite eminent figures in the cultural world read 100 books each and meet periodically to deliberate. These deliberations can get intense, not just a quick dust up, but a nine month debate. This is a stealth operation. We promise the nominators and selectors anonymity so that our winners are chosen in a process free from political pressures and arm twisting. The outcome is a list of the 10 authors the selectors feel are the most promising in the country in this cohort. You are those authors. In due course, each of you will receive a book which the selectors believe has some special relevance to your writing and of course, the first installment of your $50,000 award. We are not only proud to announce the winners here tonight, but proud of the roster of laureates U10 are joining because they have written so much, so well, and some have been recognized with National Book Awards, Tony Awards, Pulitzer Prizes, and MacArthur Fellowships, and sometimes simply treasured by devoted readers and esteemed by their colleagues. One or two of the winners may even become a celebrity. But that's not the object of the game because that's something other people do to you. What these awards are designed to encourage is for you to go out and produce something that will be wonderful for yourselves. I now present Courtney Hodell, who will introduce our speaker, Tracy K. Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Across four collections of poetry, in language that is unadorned but electric, Tracy K. Smith has examined the power of grief, of desire, of history, of the erasure and return of language. Her collection Life on Mars, which won a Pulitzer Prize, encompassed science and science fiction, life and afterlife, the Hubble Telescope, and David Bowie. Her next book, Wade in the Water, published in her second term as Poet Laureate of the United States, drew directly on letters written by black soldiers in the Civil War and their wives and widows, creating found documentary poems in conversation with her own lyric. She's written a memoir about childhood and becoming called Ordinary Light, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and prompted Hilton Alls of the New Yorker to call her Our Emerson. She's written a libretto for opera and launched an essential five-minute podcast called The Slowdown that has floated more than 500 poems to listeners on the current of her gorgeous voice. Her new book, Such Color, New and Selected Poems, is forthcoming this fall from Grey Wolf. When you follow this nimble dance from form to form and attend to her profound engagement with the interiority of others, the connective force that emerges is the power of listening. To the lilt of a phrase, to the rumble of a troubling memory, to past voices that still lack for a hearing, to the stillness of an audience assimilating a poem before it moves them to speak. As Poet Laureate, she transformed that lifetime's project of listening into a two-year tour of the country, bringing the intimate communal experience of poetry to places often left out of the public conversation around literature. She wanted, in her words, to push back against the pervasive narrative of America as a divided nation. The narrative that says people in the rural heartland have nothing in common, not even a shared language with those of us in urban centers. And what she found in these places was a hunger for what poetry could provide 
and a grace and eloquence in talking about it. At the end of her travels, she wrote, I wish we could muster a willingness to get lost together, which is essentially the state poems offer their readers and the poets who write them. All of us in this challenging year have had to find ways to get closer from a distance. In some ways, our confinement has opened up a chance for us to meet in a bigger place, the place of a shared love for the word and of humane curiosity about the world. We at Whiting are so grateful to have all of you with us from across the country and beyond its borders to listen to Tracy K. Smith. Hello and congratulations to the 2021 Whiting Award winners, writers of achievement, originality, promise, and urgency. Writers whose voices, imaginations, and sense of conscience make it easier for the rest of us to keep doing the difficult but essential work of feeling, hoping, trusting, remembering, and contributing, each in our own way. Which is to say, your work coaxes something awake in us. And awake is how the world needs us to be. Activated, stirred up, in possession of a potent and deliberate animus. I think that's the state in which this unruly time is best met. I've been trying to think of an alternate narrative with which to describe the moment we've been living now for more than a year. Because we know the central story. The way from one day to the next, we found ourselves at the epicenter of a pandemic of such magnitude, it outpaced even our experts' most sobering projections. The devastating loss of lives that we endured, the more than 500,000 lives lost to COVID, and the inequities that COVID exacerbated, and the ever-increasing number of lives lost to the ravages of hatred, violence, and injustice. All of that experienced while in the strange and isolating holding pattern of quarantine, lockdown, and day-to-day social distancing. A state where time itself seems to be both speeding up and screeching to a halt all at once. There's more, of course, to the collective story of this ongoing moment. A generation of activists awakened, galvanized to bring our nation and its institutions into the light of justice. The bald truth of our national division, the havoc of our hatred, and democracy rallying to right itself like a patient struggling to breathe, to speak, to rise. It rallies still. This is what we know, what we have struggled to process and even to affect in the last 12 or more months. But what is the alternate narrative I want to offer to you on this festive occasion, this moment when we promise you that what you have built thus far out of words will last, that it will help us to continue doing the human work of love and hope and struggle? Early in the pandemic, I received a strange text message from an old friend. We've known each other long enough to trust that lapses of communication don't change the love we feel for one another. It had been a long time since our last interaction, more than a year if I'm remembering correctly. Long enough that I no longer had a handy point of reference for her message, which read, Have you heard from the ancestors lately? Let me correct myself. I mean, I no longer had a shared point of reference for her message, but her message reached me clearly in the active muddle of my own thoughts, fears, wishes, and my mounting sense of need. Because I felt lost, helpless, abandoned by the structures and processes that had given me the sense of surety back when the world was operating as it was supposed to. The vocabulary of my friend's question, have you heard from the ancestors lately, reminded me 
that the psychic or spiritual longing that had begun to stir in me during quarantine, the wish to tap into knowledge, no, not knowledge, but a knowing capable of freeing me from my fear and my fury, that, that wasn't new. In fact, I'd intimated it to her years earlier over lunch in Soho one afternoon. I told her that I wanted to become one of those people who knows, who hears, who listens to the ancestors. Not metaphorically, but for real. People like the great poet Lucille Clifton and the memoirist and historian Cornelia Bailey. I texted my friend back, And ever since, we've been in a long, logic-transcending conversation about listening, seeing, meditating, and yes, hearing from the ancestors. Which is to say that one alternate version of the story we've been living this past year can be told not in fidelity to the forward movement of time, but rather an acknowledging time's ability to fold in upon itself so that moments separated from one another by centuries and generations can seem almost, when the conditions are right, to align and to touch. How many are we? Many are we. What have we been led here to learn to teach, we have been led here to learn, to teach. Is life within our grasp? Life within is in our grasp. Have we ever felt death so near as we do this year? Have we ever? Near, dear, year upon year. That's what my ancestors sound like. Their answers to my questions refuse to solve anything, but they dissuade me of the need for quick resolution. They insist that I put myself into proper alignment with eternity so I can keep taking the small but necessary steps only I can take. Yes, it is hard. Yes, I feel haunted even hunted sometimes, but I must keep at it. Together, they and I and you and everyone else laboring in earnest at being human must cover every inch of distance, though it be endless. This is one version of the work you are being honored for doing. You are mapping your allotment of eternity You are laying the infrastructure for some frazzled soul somewhere ages and ages hence to pause, to seek, to receive, and to continue on. We recognize at this ceremony your unique capacity to do this work in such a way that it bears fruit in the here and now, while also extending roots into the farthest layers of human experience. The winners of the 2021 Whiting Award are Joshua Bennett, Jordan E. Cooper, Stephen Dunn, Tope Falarin, Danetta Lavinia Grays, Marwa Halel, Sarah Stewart Johnson, Sylvia Khoury, Levin Osman, and Sandria Phillips. We congratulate you all. Thank you and be well. Thank you, Tracy, for your remarks and for announcing the winners. Now, for the first time in the 36-year history of the awards, you'll get to hear the writers immediately reading from their work. This work can be joyful and it can be wrenching. Some of it uses explicit language or terms of personal identity that some might find unsettling. I'm pleased to welcome previous Whiting Award winner, Elena Passarello, who will introduce the writers and read the judges' citations. Elena is the author of two essay collections, Let Me Clear My Throat and Animals Strike Curious Poses, which was translated into five languages and named a Best 
book of 2018 by the New York Times Book Review. Her work has appeared recently in National Geographic, the Paris Review, and the Best American Science and Nature Writing. You can hear her weekly on the nationally syndicated arts and culture radio show, Livewire. Elena Passarello. Joshua Bennett is the author of three books of poetry and literary criticism, The Sobbing School, Being Property Once Myself, and Ode. He is the Mellon Assistant Professor of English and Creative Writing at Dartmouth College, and his next book of creative nonfiction, Spoken Word, A Cultural History, is forthcoming from Knopf. Joshua Bennett's criticism radically expands his ideas of what it is to be alive in the world, reshuffling hierarchies of knowledge and power and hinting at a new way of being. His poetry is piercingly intelligent. There is so much yearning and emotion alongside a mesmerizing musical craft. It welcomes us intimately into the speaker's powerful consciousness, into the landscape of his family and his outsiderhood. Bennett takes up the legacy of W.E.B. Du Bois in this fluid movement between genres, illuminating what it means to see things as they are and to call them by their most merciless names. You are so articulate with your hands, she says, and it's the first time the word doesn't hurt. I respond by citing something age inappropriate from Aristotle, drawing mostly from his idea that hands are what make us human every gesture the embodiment of our desire for invention or care. And I'm not sure about that last part, but it seemed like a polite response at the time, and I'm not accustomed to not needing to fight. If my hands speak with conviction, then blame my stupid mouth for its lack of weaponry or sweetness. I clap when I'm angry because it's the best way to get the heat out. Pop says that my words are bigger than my mouth, but these hands can block a punch build a bookcase, feed a child, and when's the last time you saw a song do that? Barber Song. Postmodern blackness blacksmith, straight razor reshaping self-esteem. You dream in geometries unreachable by any other means. Speak and entire phrases abandon standard American etymology hence. You liberate waves from the sea, corn rose from the cornfield, reclaim fade, so I now hear the word and imagine only abundance. Caesar never meant anything to me, but a cut so close you could see the shimmer of a man's thinking. You were how we first learned to bend language built to unmake us, accept implausible risk, some much older man, shaver in hand like a baton full of wasp gossip, asking, with the grain or against, and the question feels damn near existential, given this is the only place we can live in such thoughtless proximity to another person's open hands, be held by the face, ask outright to be made glamorous, shaped by your polymathic brilliance, you bi-weekly psychoanalyst, first stop before funeral, before wedding and block party alike, you soothsayer, cooing children to calm as they sit in the chair for the first time, as still a storm as one might reasonably expect. You ethicist, defending hairlines at all cost, your vigilance keeping online and otherwise slander at bay. Philosopher King, thesaurus in the drawer, dominoes and scotch and barbasol adorning your countertop right above the chorus line of clippers swaying to the clamor of checkmates and offhand insults now filling the shop each moving as if the unfettered locks of some great metal monster some faraway watcher and you guardian of it all clean as a pope Jordan E. Cooper is an Obie Award-winning playwright and performer who was recently chosen to be one of Out Magazine's Entertainers of the Year. Last spring, he had a sold-out run of his play, Ain't No Mo, a New York Times critic's pick. He is currently filming The Ms. Pat Show, an R-rated old-school sitcom that he created for BET+, which will debut later this year. Hilarious, bombastic, electric. Jordan Cooper's plays celebrate spectacle and explode conventions, mixing the taboo with the silly, the profound with the profane. 
This mordant yet exhilarating work raises a glorious cry of anger. Soulful and richly characterized, it is full of tender beauty and terror and joy. His plays dwell both in the real world and the beyond, a reality in which anguish and hope coexist in equal measure. Hi, uh, I'm reading from my piece, Ain't No Mo, um, and uh, I, this is from a character of Peaches, uh, who's a fabulous drag queen flight attendant who is helping millions and millions of black folks get to the new destination of Africa. And this is a monologue that she's delivering to a very reluctant passenger. Easy. Didn't nobody say nothing about no easy. No, you ain't heard me say nothing about no easy. Easy don't know me and I don't know easy. Easy. Nigga, what you doing? That shit is hell ain't making shit easy for nobody talking about some easy. Nigga, you know how many more of these motherfuckers I still got to scan in after you? Do you know how hard these damn heels is raping and stabbing my damn feet? Do you know how much sweat this wig is keeping from gushing down the front of my damn face right now? Do you know how hard it was for me to wake up this morning when the sun started yelling out my name easy? <laughs> From the moment they plucked me off my mama's peach tree, I was ripe, round, and full of juice. And if easy knew me, I wouldn't be wasting away in a world full of folks who hate peaches. I got my ass whooped last night by a group of jealous niggas who was pissed that I looked better than the bitches they fucked the night before. That wasn't even white folks that did that. They look like me. And every one of them is standing somewhere in this line waiting for me to scan their ticket to a better life. Seems like niggas will never accept any other nigga that don't fit into their tiny idea of what a nigga can be. Any kind of sparkle, the spark is too sweet, they gotta spit on. Shoving out the shine and stomping out the sugar. But I realized a long time ago that sometimes Black hate black more than any white ever could. And knowing that I'm going to a place where all I see is black, it scares the fuck out of me. So yeah, the shit ain't easy, but I sashayed my sexy ass on the work so I can get this coin and make this flight. You hear me talking about some easy nigga that color your skin decided to wear today. It ain't never too comfort in a word like that. Black folks ain't meant to know that kind of word. Knowing that kind of word just makes you weak as fuck and dull. That's why if I ever see easy, <laughs> I'm across the motherfucking street because that nigga is evil. The nigga ain't nothing but ignorance. Nigga ain't nothing but darkness and destruction, fire and death. Baby, you ain't going to find easy nowhere on that plane, so don't go looking for him. This here flight is meant to take us back to a place where we can start over. Hmm? Build and own something, something that can never again be taken away. Us leaving this land ain't what's easy. And it ain't what's smooth. It's what builds. Now please, Step forward. Stephen Dunn is the author of two novels from Tarpaulin Sky Press, Potted Meat and Water and Power. Potted Meat was a finalist for the Colorado Book Award and adapted to a short film by Foothills Productions. He was born and raised in West Virginia and teaches in the MFA programs at Regis University and Cornell College. Stephen Dunn's fiction has no varnish, only the reporting of life in its dizzying plenitude. His narratives about life in the military draw on his experience as a veteran to explore powerlessness, the discomforts of the body, the need to hide one's sexuality, the desire to assert control, but it finds its strength in softness. Formally inventive, his work is a finely judged orchestration of different perspectives, mixing fiction with poetry, journalism, visual art. On every page, you feel the inquisitive and exuberant persona of the author. This intimacy makes possible a piercing investigation of the concepts of service and country. 
Hi everybody, I'll be reading a story from my book Potted Meat called Heavy D. I'm trying to teach my sister a song I recorded off the radio. Listen real close, I say. One, two, tell me what you got. Let me slip my coin inside your slider, hit the jackpot. One, two, she says. Tell me something about coins and a jackpot. God damn it, I say, you got it wrong. It's not that hard. Shut up, she says, this is stupid. Why do I need to learn this anyway? Cause it's important like the Pledge of Allegiance. I know the chorus, she says. Now that we found love, what are we gonna do? That ain't enough, I say. You gotta learn the whole thing. Why? Since you already know it, you rap and I sing. No, what if I can't talk one day? And if you don't know it, then who will? Okay, she says, just go slow the next time. I rap the first two lines. She gets it. I add more. She gets that. After about an hour, she gets the last lines. I'm not quite sure of what is going down, but I'm feeling hunky-dory with this thing that I found. I rewind the tape and we rap the song three times perfect. She says, if you actually found love, what would you do with it? That's a stupid question, I say. No, it ain't, she says, just answer it. What would you do with love? Tope Falaran is a Nigerian-American writer. He won the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2013 and was shortlisted once again in 2016. He was also named to the 2014 Africa 39 list of the most promising African writers under 40. A Particular Kind of Black Man is his first book. An engrossing storyteller, Tope Falaran crafts marvelous sentences that act as clear panes of glass through which one glimpses an upside-down world. His fable-like novel is playful in its nostalgia, painful in its examination of how ready-made beliefs are overlaid onto the minds of children while they struggle to find a self. Falaran captures the surreal judder that comes from growing up in America and then leaving it to return to the country you're supposedly from. His work is threaded with secrets, some that must be broken, open, and brought to life, and others that must be held close to the heart. I'm reading from my novel. It's called A Particular Kind of Black Man. I am in Lagos, Nigeria, and I am looking for my mother. My cousin places his hand on my shoulder and gently nudges me to the left. I pause to glance at him. He looks so much like my mother that maybe he should have been my mother's son. The sun is throbbing above us. It's speeding a strange rhythm into my body, something I've never felt before. He points down the street above the stalls and bobbing heads. I nod and begin to walk but then my cousin grabs my arm. Are you sure you're ready, he asks. I smile confidently. It's actually a frown disguised as a smile. I'm sure anyone can see this. Yes, I've been waiting for this for a long time. My cousin smiles kindly, but there's something indecipherable there in the corners of his lips. We walk past the tall, crumbling building. The exterior is composed of some kind of yellow stone, now chipped in many places, and the roof is tin. Green vines finger every available crevice and, the, and long lizards scoot across the walls, so fast and green that it seems like they've been exiled from some ancient myth. I glance at my cousin again. He smiles ruefully. Before us stands an arch. We pass beneath it into a wide courtyard. All around us, the windows reflect the light and clothes are strung from lines that crisscross the open space above our heads. I glance up at the sky. The sun is beaming down on me, like a booming flash before an impossibly large camera takes my picture. I have never felt this uncomfortable in the sun, so aware of how conspicuous it is. Has it always been this bright? Maybe a different sun shines over this courtyard, an angrier sun. I'm afraid I might go blind staring at the sun like this, so I look down, and only now do I realize that the ground beneath my feet is pure gold. The wind is picking up. The windows are screaming with light. I look back up. Now I see the sky peeking through the gaps between the shirts and pants, and I can't tell if the sky is too low or the clothes too high, because the water blue air above my head seems close enough to touch, and the clothes are so distant that they look like multicolored clouds, clouds with buttons and zippers and pockets and sleeves. 
my thoughts are too loud, too loud. I close my eyes. In the darkness, with my thoughts bumping against my eyelids, I begin to breathe more easily. I listen to myself inhale and exhale. I feel my cousin again, his love for me passing through his hand into my shoulder. My heart slows some. I feel the heat from the sun settling on my face. I do not have to look up at the sky to know that the sun has returned to its normal size. When I open my eyes, I see the clothes swing gently from the clotheslines and the decaying concrete beneath my feet. The windows are still shining, but benevolently. I feel my body returning to itself, and now I understand why I lost my composure. I can no longer hear the din of Lagos, the cars and buses and curses and pigeon. My anxious thoughts expanded themselves to make up for the sudden absence of sound. Even now, looking around, the silence is amplifying everything. This silence feels permanent, not like a placeholder for something to come. Danetta Lavinia Grays is a Brooklyn-based playwright who proudly hails from Columbia, South Carolina. Her plays include Where We Stand, Warriors Don't Cry, Last Night and the Night Before, Laid to Rest, The Review of How to Eat Your Opposition, The New Normal, and The Cowboy is Dying. Danetta is a Lucille Lortel, Drama League, and a Delco Award nominee. In the plays of Danetta Lavinia Grays, verse, music, and ritual create a living and present tense connection. Her stories emerge through a painstaking process of stripping away the accumulated fictions held by her characters, as if truth can emerge only through excavation. Grays uses every part of a theater space and fills it with oratory. She courageously asks a moral engagement from her audience. Her portrayal of family, its complicated manifestations of love, its convoluted sense of responsibility, feels revelatory. We come to know her characters as deeply as anyone in our own lives. This is from Last Night and the Night Before. This is dawning. All hands assume the position in praise of her coming. Peasants' knees bent in welcome, an obedient Percheron nudges the lion to bow his head in homage. Knights and warrior supinated grips hold steady the varied lengths of the horizon's edge as we wait for her. A willow tree branch's unexpected reach upward tickles the air and purifies a now jubilant wind so she may breathe joy. The earth checks its pace, the moon winks to test the twinkle of her servant stars, and nature sets a table full of bounty so she may go no days wanting. And we wait patiently. No need for anxious coaxing. She knows how to make an entrance. The grandest of ladies do. She has granted grace the honor of serving her as escort. The decision is hers, in fact. In fact, no mother chooses a child. For when grace is given his command, he acts as carrier, sending notice of a calling to the mother, that final hue in a symphony of verdant readiness, who obeys and waits for her. Marwa Halal is the author of Invasive Species and Antibody, forthcoming from Nightboat Books in 2022. She's the winner of Bomb Magazine's Biennial Poetry Contest, and has been awarded fellowships from the Jerome Foundation, Naifa Niska, Poets House, and Kave Kanem, among others. She was born in Al Mansura, Egypt, and lives in Brooklyn. The poems of Marwa Halal are not only marvelously various in form, but emotionally epiphanic. We feel the powerful yearning and resolve in her work, which layers natural, cultural, and even typographic landscapes. Her acrobatic syntax amplifies and refracts meaning. She has titled her collection Invasive Species, and these poems investigate not only ecological or political phenomena, but a powerful poetic identity. The passionate personality of this artist shines through, and we grasp the urgency of her search for the just. Reading from Invasive Species. 
In the first world, people arrive at cubicles in a rage. At day's end, they punch bags hanging from the ceiling, fight their reflections in the mirror, sprint on padded treadmills, while a cop sleeps outside in a car, its engine running. Poem to be read from right to left. I learned my first language second. C, C. Native I am mistaken for everywhere I go. To sun and moon, like the letter lamb. Sound like lamb, but think like fox. Reminds me of this recurring dream being chased in a circle, like duck, duck, goose, but there were no other children. I got tired of counting the number of English words it takes to capture one in another. Sarah Stewart Johnson grew up in Kentucky before becoming a planetary scientist. She now teaches at Georgetown and works on NASA missions. Her writing has appeared in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Los Angeles Times, The Harvard Review, and Best American Science and Nature Writing. Her book, The Sirens of Mars, Searching for Life on Another World, was selected as one of the New York Times' 100 Notable Books of 2020. Though the subject of Sarah Stewart Johnson's work is Mars, the life in her brilliantly realized book resides on Earth. In our desire to populate the red planet, our disappointment at the failures of various missions, our persistence in returning to uncover its long-held secrets. Full of joy and existential curiosity, the book's images and metaphors take up residence in our minds and burn there, connecting scientific inquiry with deep questions about human existence. In every line, Johnson makes us feel the passion for discovery and the desire to connect. Hi, I'm going to be reading from The Sirens of Mars. Searching for life on another world. One of my favorite things inside the box, tucked in a bent folder, is a set of pictures that Opportunity took in 2010. All those years ago, it seemed like such a marvel that the rover was still working. No one would have dared to believe that it would have thousands more souls of science. The dust was building, the power dropping. It had been traversing the planet for six years and was already long past its 90-day expiration date. But then a gust of wind whistled across Meridiani Planum and cleaned some of the fine particles off of the solar panels. With the unexpected spike in electricity output, the team commanded the panoramic camera to take a series of pictures that could be strung together with time-lapse photography. The flickering images captured by the rover are unforgettable. They are on an ancient plane near the equator of Mars. Against an ochre sky on a dusty day, the sun is setting. A white circle of light is drifting down over the dark desert. The terrain is bare and the sky is still in the half-light of dusk. And on the horizon, with the dust having scattered the red light away, the sunset glows an eerie, baffling, incandescent blue. The color makes no sense. It rattles the mind. It rips at the seams of the physical world. Scientifically, I understand it. The properties of the light, the microphysics of the system. There's no mystery to behold. And yet the mystery, like so many others in our universe, is profound, nearly incomprehensible. That blue, so recognizable, yet so foreign, shining in a halo around our shared star, calling us like a siren. Sylvia Khoury is a New York-born writer of French and Lebanese descent. Her plays include Selling Kabul, Power Strip, 
Against the Hillside and The Place Women Go. Her awards include the L. Arnold Weisberger Award and J. Harris Commission, and a Citation of Excellence from the Lawrence Hatcher Awards. She'll obtain her MD from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in May 2021. Sylvia Khoury's plays focus on the U.S. presence in Afghanistan and Pakistan, evoking grand geop geopolitical drama through simple human gesture. Compelling revelations drive the narrative tension as she explores, among other complexities, the relationship between those who practice surveillance in our military and those they surveil, as the watcher begins to identify with the watched. Khoury breaks down barriers between human beings, revealing the powerful lines of connection that exist and persist. I'm reading an excerpt from my play, Selling Cobble. You can be angry with me, Jawade. Please, let loose an uninhibited word. You're a good man who's been made the guardian of a coward. I am not a good man. No modesty, please. I have no right to modesty, Tarun. I have sold Kabul for a television set. What? All you have told me, all the spite, all the insults, all the provocations, I don't answer because it's all true. Jawade, no, listen, I didn't mean anything by it. I've been lonely and agitated. It's all true. Will my wife be safe? I think so. And our children, God willing? I think so. But my country? I have willed myself not to think of it. I have given up my right to opinions. I experience only shame. I'm telling you, you shouldn't. If my father could see, Tarun, what I am doing, he would die twice over. If he could retrace his footsteps from the grave, he would have never moved inside my mother. He would have drowned me quietly when I was born. He would take back the gunshots in the city celebrating my birth. He would tell the neighbors, hush, let no sound escape your lips in celebration of this thing who is not my son, who has sold Kabul for a television set. For my sister to have a child. And how is a child different than a television set, my brother? Vanity, all vanity, and nothing more. You don't say this to Afia. No, thank God. All I can tell you, Tarun, is that next time there is an opportunity, I will not cower behind my store, talking about protection and providing, watching braver men risk everything. I hope that isn't true for my sister's sake. Your sister can't sleep for the shame. Ladhan Osman is the author of Exiles of Eden, winner of the Hurston Wright Legacy Award, and The Kitchen Dweller's Testimony, winner of the Sillerman Prize. She's received fellowships from the Lannan Foundation, Kaveh Kanem, the Michener Center, and the Fine Arts Work Center. Osman's directorial debut, The Ascendance, is streaming now. Informed by world events, as well as ancient myths, Ladhan Osman's dazzling and incisive poetry creates vibrant connections between generations of women, between the self and history, and between our bodies and the natural world. Some of her most fiercely imagined poems incorporate photographs, opening up a charged space between what is seen and what is heard. Marked by a capacious imagination and an emotionally resplendent sense of metaphor, her lines fray and pile up, pushing the vital, potent lyric further. I'm reading from the Exiles of Eden, and this is The Bee's Gospel. I enter a household wherein a woman uses stamps with blooms. Zinnia, aster, primrose. She adorns envelopes, remembers her mother's destroyed marigolds and grieves for them again. At night, a man puts his palm on her temple, then her crown, unfolding meadows and every fruit and root. I sit on the headboard and wait for permission to enter. It is an expanding paradise. Everything knows its relationship to light, to darkness, pursues various means to the same ends and his hand contains the aliving spice of a room full of palms. He tells her she is the seasons. He pursues a single lyric, wears several musks at once, 
In the morning, she splits a dense fruit. Within it are chambers, combs. She extracts seeds on the table, spends songs cleaning them. My guardian waits outside the window. I like how this man looks when he offers things. Every object a gift, cup, washcloth, his scented chest and temples. I don't know which one is the queen, so I fly between them both. And the backs of their necks are the same. They are mirrors facing each other across a well-lit room. I am in a frenzy. I visit a cup whose color I can't resist. Summer sky after three nights without rain. It contains a sweet fluid. I don't know the name of this nectar. It causes me to forget. I have to be near it. On his knuckles, on his shoulders. What does it want? She asks. It doesn't know, he says. What does it know of what humans made? Then let him go and tell the others. Let him recite. They try to kill me, not sincerely. I drop from ceiling to floor until they too are exhausted. She opens a window. I stay, parse their fragrances as she parsed those seeds. I want him to lie with her again. Show me multitudinous gardens. My attendant can wait no longer. I salute her bare right breast and watch her skin prickle and her scalp flush and fly out. Zandria Phillips is a poet and visual artist from rural Ohio. The recipient of the Judith A. Markowitz Award for Emerging Writers, Zandria has received fellowships from Oberlin College, Cave Canem, and Callaloo. Their poetry has been published in American Poetry Review, Poets.org, Black Warrior Review, and elsewhere. Their chapbook, Reasons for Smoking, won the 2016 Seattle Review Chapbook Contest, judged by Claudia Rankin. Hull, the recipient of a Lambda Literary Award, is their first book. Reveling in brevity and lushness, Zandria Phillips's poems feel revolutionary. Formally superb, but with a constant tilting of expectation in image and phrase. Phillips writes about intimacy as intimately as possible, writes about pain as painfully as possible, and writes about joy as joyfully as possible. V's poems aren't afraid to get messy, with risky extended similes and unresolved contradictions. We feel the body's sexuality and also its vulnerability. We feel its history of violation, but also its resistance of those violations. Through the making of meaning, we feel its capacity to love and its capacity to give. I'm reading Social Death and Address from Hull. I write to you from the predicament of blackness. You see, I've been here all my life and found, on the atomic level, it's impossible to walk through most doorways. I can, however, move through walls. I write to you from the empty seat that isn't empty. I write to you when a feel is copped. I write myself out of bed. I write to you as the spook who sat by the door. I write to you from Olivia Pope's apolitical mouth. I am here because I could never get the hang of body death, though it has been presented to me like one would offer a Rukfeed cocktail or high interest loan. I am only here because I started eating again. I am only here because I am ineligible to exist otherwise. I am only here because I left and returned through an Atlantic wormhole. I write to you as the American version of me. In the American version, Orpheus' liar is a gun. Eurydice thinks of doctors, or rather, a cold hand. It feels like one is sliding its sterile nails over the curtains of her womb. Once, a healer's hands passed through my flesh, and I went on trial for stealing ten fingers. When my spoon scrapes the bottom of a bowl, it sounds like a choir of siblings naming stars after their favorite meals. 
Physicists are classifying new matters and energies every day. Dark matter, black flesh are in high demand and we never see a penny. I urge you, if you see a sister walk through walls or survive the unsurvivable, sip your drink and learn to forget or love the taxed apparition before you. Congratulations to the 10 winners of the 2021 Whiting Awards. You can read more about these writers on the Whiting website, www.whiting.org, and you can also sign up there to receive a chapbook of excerpts from their work. We've dropped this link, as well as the author's book titles, into the comments to help you find them at your local bookstore. Please support the heroic booksellers who are keeping literary culture alive in this pandemic this year. And thank you all for joining us.